Have you ever been part of a turf war? So-called war. You know, it happens all the time. Somebody in the family, immediate family, extended family, doesn't see eye to eye with you. They don't see things exactly the way you see them, or you don't see things the way they do. And it can be sometimes there's a little bit of friction. You've never experienced family friction before? Hmm. <laughs> oh. Can I come and live in your family? <laughs> Emmy and I together? <laughs> Turf wars happen everywhere. And whether we like it or not, they're happening in the church. The church. Not just the Presbyterian Church in Canada, but the church all over the world. Because we approach things from different perspectives, and we interpret things differently, and we see things differently, and we experience things differently, and, and unfortunately we engage in turf wars thinking that I'm right and you're wrong, or you thinking that you're right and I'm wrong. Well, let me give you a, a little example. A man was walking across a bridge. And halfway across the bridge came across another man who was beside his car, standing beside his car, which had a flat tire, and he was looking at the flat tire like he was completely lost as to how to change a tire. So the man who was walking came up to him and said, Are you a Christian? Yes. As a matter of fact, I am, the man with the flat tire said. Oh. Are you Catholic or Protestant? Well, I'm, I'm Protestant. <gasps> so am I. Are you Presbyterian or Baptist? <gasps> I'm Baptist. Oh my goodness, so am I. Well, are you Southern Baptist or American Baptist? <laughs> yeah. I'm Southern Baptist. <gasps> oh my goodness, so am I. I'm Southern Baptist. Are you original Southern Baptist or Southern Baptist Reformed? Oh, I'm Southern Baptist Reformed. Oh my goodness, so am I. Southern Baptist Reformed. This is so cool. I can't believe it. But tell me, are you Southern Baptist Reformed of the Reformation from 1879 or Southern Baptist Reformed from the Reformation of 1915? The man with the flat tire replied, I'm Southern Baptist of the, the, the Reformation of 1915. Hmm. Heretic. And the man walked off and said, I can't help you. <laughs> we do it all the time. Inside the church and outside the church. Turf wars all over our world. In almost every aspect of our life with people. Do you know the only way you can avoid a turf war? Jesus would probably want to pat them on the back 
give them some cake and say, well done, good and faithful disciples. Instead, Jesus surprises them. No one who does a miracle in my name can the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Jesus continues to try to teach his followers what following Jesus, what true discipleship is all about, what it really means, especially the cost of following Jesus. At the heart of his lesson is the message that discipleship, being a follower of Jesus, is about service to others, sacrifice for the sake of other people. Privilege, power, rank, prestige, honor, have nothing to do with glimpses of glory of, of God's kingdom. They don't make up any aspect of the resume of a Christ follower if that's the focus. It's only in and it's only about service to others, Jesus insists. It's only working for others, caring for others with the same compassion of God through which we see the kingdom of God growing here on earth. Such as a task as simple as giving a cup of water to drink to someone who is thirsty is revealed as the kind of action that God notices. It's being compassionate and helpful because we belong to Jesus. Not because the other person deserves it or not, but because we are Christ's. And because being compassionate and being caring is exactly how God treats every one of us. Jesus does not paint a rosy portrait of what a real disciple looks like. Following the way of true service may require, he says here, significant sacrifices on the part of his followers. Do whatever it takes, Jesus is cautioning in today's text, to keep yourself and your actions from being roadblocks to other people, from preventing them from seeing and encountering God in Christ. Instead, seek to be street signs along the path of life, of faith in Jesus Christ. Are our words, are our actions more like stumbling blocks that we throw down in front of other people? Or are they stepping stones for other people to come to know and see Jesus? What Jesus says here has incredible shock value. I'm going to ask you a couple of hard questions. Have any of you ever sinned with your eyes? Why are we all blinking? Why didn't we cut our eyes out? How many of you ever sinned with your hands? Why do we have our hands? Why haven't we cut them off? Isn't that what Jesus said in this passage? It's better to enter into the kingdom of God maimed and blind than to be cast into hell with two hands and two eyes. Isn't that what he said? His words have incredible shock value. In order to be a real follower, a genuine follower of Jesus, he warns that we must be willing to sacrifice everything about ourselves to the task of his kingdom, the work of his love for all peoples. But Jesus didn't end on such a heavy note of cutting off hands and gouging out eyes and cutting off feet and casting yourselves into the sea. Instead, he concludes it with a good statement of blessing. He makes a promise to all would-be disciples of his, to all who are willing to struggle against the root of all that, selfishness. To everybody who wants to follow Jesus, we must struggle daily. Have you ever noticed? 
struggle daily against our selfishness, Jesus offers us that we will be salted with fire. It's a reference both to the strength and the steadfastness and the unfailing love of God in our lives. For any disciple source of power must only come from the Spirit of God. It's a message that appears again and again all throughout the Scriptures. God works in unexpected ways through the words and actions of all types of people to bring about His purposes, His message, His truth, His love, His mission in all the world. The Holy Spirit continues to work through all sorts of people today, some of whom we know, some of whom are, who are, are just like us, they look just like you and I. God does work through the Presbyterian Church in Canada, yes indeed. But some people that we don't know and we may never meet, yes, God does work through the Baptist Church, whether it's Southern Baptist of 1879 or 1915. Yes, God does work through the Lutheran Church, regardless of which hundred branches of the Lutheran Church it is. God works through people we may never meet. And God works through people whom we might disagree with, whose position on a certain issue is different from our position, and lo, we wouldn't, don't ever get in the same room with them. God works through both. God works through those people that we might even be inclined to have turf wars with, or already had turf wars with. And some people, God will work through some people that we might just be very surprised, does knock the socks right off us, that he is actually working his miracle of love through. Well, after all, God seeks to work his miracle of love through you and I, doesn't he? And some people must shake their heads at those Presbyterians. Oh my goodness. The scripture reminds us, as the psalmist says, the God who holds this great earth and vast seas is not restricted. God is not restricted by human notions, by human emotions, by human limitations. God touches human hearts and accomplishes his miracles, his wonders, in ways and places that we might never anticipate. And here today, this morning, we are reminded through this sacrament of Christian baptism that one of the first places that we are called and we, are, we can and we should show the compassion and the care of Jesus, our Savior, is with our own children and with our own families. And that we as a congregation have the calling and the blessing to also show the exact same sort of care and compassion to all children through worship upstairs and through worship downstairs with Sunday school and everything that we seek to do as a community of faith as we have sought to do for the last 31 years. When your parents have your children back home, you indicate you desire to have <clears throat> your children grow up and live as God's beloved children, brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus, and to be guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Through birth, God gives a child to you as parents. Through baptism, you are in a way giving your child, saying to God, you're giving this child back as we participate in the parenthood that God has blessed us with, taking our source as God, the parent, the ultimate parent of all creation. And that frees us this understanding of baptism frees us from a sense of owning our children and commanding them around and enables us to let them live and encourage them and help them to live free and joyfully in Christ to bring them emotional and physical and spiritual freedom, freedom that enables every one of us, every one of our children to live fully as God's beloved child. Baptism reminds 
parents of this calling and helps us to set our children on the path to full maturity of the Christ life, the Christ like life. In a sense, baptism is a call to parents of baptized children and to the baptized themselves, to each one of us, to choose consistently and constantly for the light, the light of Christ in the midst of a darkened world. To constantly say and consistently say yes to Jesus in the midst of a society and a world that denies him, that denies his life, his truth, and his love. God has called all of us, especially through our baptisms, to say yes to Jesus. And today we have several families who are saying yes through the gift of baptism, yes to Jesus.